Tufts University with a uh, Bachelor of Science in Biology and completed his Doctorate of Medicine at Tufts University of Medicine. His postdoctoral training includes a surgical residency at Henry Ford Hospital, a fellowship in extracorporeal life support and surgical critical care at the University of Michigan Hospitals, and a pediatric surgery residency at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. It takes a long time to train these guys. <laughs> We were privileged to have Dr. Pranikoff join the Wake Forest Baptist Hospital family in 1997. His leadership and commitment in both the academic arena and the medical center are exemplary. He currently serves on numerous committees. His leadership has been recognized in the medical center as well. He serves as the chairman of the IRB committee and newly formed practice council. In addition, he serves as the surgical co-director of our pediatric intensive care unit and the di director of the extracorporeal life support program. He's recognized as a fellow of the American College of Surgeons. His accomplishments include numerous publications and presentations. I've personally worked with him in both the clinical and the administrative capacities. He always brings enthusiasm and thoughtfulness to any task and see, seeks to identify solutions which meets goals of all. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Pranikoff. Thank you for that kind introduction. Let's see if I can get this to work. Can you hear me? All right, great. Well, thank you. I hope everyone is, still has a little bit of energy. If anyone wants to get up and raise your, raise your hands or shake your feet, feel free to do that while I start. Um, I'll start by saying I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about burns and children, uh, uh, probably something that most of you have some experience with, either personally or with your own children, and hopefully to a very minor degree. Burns are very common, and we're going to talk about uh, burns and, and more severe burns than hopefully you have experience with. I'm going to talk a little bit about the epidemiology, we'll go into a little bit about diagnosis and uh, management of some of these burns. I'm going to try not to get too technical. We're not going to talk about surgical uh, management. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about outcomes, and I'll share some data with you from uh, some of our own research at the hospital, and then talk a little bit about prevention, which is, in most of these areas, it's just, which is really neglected. So burns, like I said, are a pretty common problem. Two and a half million uh, people are burned in the United States each year who seek care. There's m many more people who have minor burns from the stove or from a, a cigarette. 100,000 of those patients require hospitalization each year, and up to 12,000 die. Not all of those are children. The crude rate of non-fatal burns is 156 per 100,000 for children under the age 18, but it's twice that for children in the zero to three age group. So those are really the at-risk children. And hospitalizations can be prolonged. Um, you know, half of them are less than a month, uh, a quarter or one to two months, and 25% can be greater than three months for the most severe. Again, the younger children, zero to four years, uh, account for a third of all burns. So that's a pretty impressive statistic. Uh, and fires and burns are the leading cause of accidental death in the home of uh, patients under age 18, I'm sorry, under age 14. The third leading cause of unintentional injury death uh, in the U.S. for children zero to nine years of age. And the fifth leading cause of unintentional injury uh, in infants in the United States. So a pretty significant cause of death and disability. 93%, so the vast majority of children are treated and released from the emergency department. So that's a, a good thing to hear. Um, and two thirds of hospitalized children um, have burns that are less than 10% total, total body surface area. So again, it's only the small percentage of burns that are really severe and require uh, burn center management. You should also not forget that burns account for about 10% of all cases of child abuse. So, you know, we are very uh, in tune to injury and to uh, intentional injury in our center. Um, and I think that most people who see children with burns 
police think about this, but it's very important to um, be suspicious. Burn victims uh, uh, who are intentionally burned are almost always young. They're almost uh, always under 10 years of age, and most of them are under two years of age. So they can't tell you that they've been burned always by, um, by you know, a member of their family or someone that they trust. Although I would say that, um, where's Debbie? Debbie's here somewhere. There's Debbie. Debbie and I remember going in to see a three-year-old a couple of years ago who we just happened to catch at the right time. His parents had left the room and he was awake and there was no one else in there. And I had just seen him, the residents had admitted him overnight and I had just gone around in the morning. We asked him, what happened to you? He said, Jimmy burned me. And who's Jimmy? Well, it's my mom's boyfriend. So no one else had really gotten that history. I'm not sure if anyone else had really asked him, but he was in a setting where he was away from all the people maybe he was, he was afraid with, uh, of. And many kids that age you know, can't lie. They won't lie to you. They'll tell you the, the answer if you ask them the right question and if they're not feeling like they're going to be punished for it. So um, you know, sometimes you will get that history. Scalds are the most frequent type of burns in, a, in abuse. So scald burns, again, have to be uh, suspicious. They have to be investigated. And you have to think and look at the patterns of injury. Contact with heated objects are also uh, seen. You know, things like cigarettes, irons, curling irons, hair dryers, and sometimes even heated kitchen utensils are, are seen in burn abuse cases. So in order to talk about burns and understand them, we need to talk a little bit about skin. Skin is, is our biggest organ in our body. It covers our whole entire body, hopefully. Um, it is, it's, it's our kind of barrier to the outside world. It keeps us warm, keeps the you know, moisture inside of us. It gives us sensation that causes us to get away from things that are too hot or too cold um, or chemicals that can harm us. It's where um, the insulation comes, it keeps us warm, and all those things are very important factors and turn out to be important factors in children and other you know, older people who are injured. If you lose skin, then you lose those defenses. This cross section kind of shows what um, is under the skin. Remember the surface, the epidermis is dead. It's all dead skin and it's, it's getting ready to be shed um, it's shed continuously. Below the epidermis is the dermis, and that layer here is really where the active part of the skin, the, the growing part and the regenerative part of the skin is. It's where you have things like hair follicles and sweat glands and nerves and some blood vessels. And as you get deeper, there are more of these kind of uh, organs underneath in the, in the um, subcutaneous uh, fat layer. And then finally, we have muscle. And in a burn, any uh, number of these layers can be affected. And depending on that, um, accounts for the type of injury that, that the body needs to regenerate. So we call burns superficial if the epidermis only is involved. Deeper burns involve the dermis. And uh, it's important to understand this because the epidermis, again, is not alive. And having it uh, taken away is of not much consequence because the dermis regenerates quickly and, and makes up a dermis, and um, that burn will heal without much problem. It's the deeper burns that involve the dermis that require more time and more healing and are prone to more complications. So we have to classify burns, and we classify them for a couple of reasons. One is so that we can understand them better, we can understand uh, how to treat them, and we can understand to tell people how we think they're going to do. So you all know probably superficial burns, first degree burns, which is like this boy on the beach who has a sunburn. He wasn't wearing his uh, big enough shirt, or he wasn't ha didn't have some enough sunscreen on, or he spent too much time in the sun. Whatever it was, he's burned. He's going to be hurting. You know it's going to be red. It's painful. But the dermis is intact, so the epidermis is all that's injured. Now, some sunburns can be crazy out of control, like passing out on the beach after you've had a case of beer and spending 12 hours on the beach, and then you can really have a more than a superficial burn from the sun. But most people 
who have sunburns um, get this kind of burn. And really, that will pretty quickly generate. Deeper burns like this, or partial thickness, or what we call second degree burns, involve the epidermis and the dermis. And you can see here this blistering, and blistering is really pretty much the hallmark of, of partial thickness burns. Now, sometimes you won't see blistering because all that's already gone, and the dermis, the epidermis is totally uh, gone, and, and all you see is this shiny underneath part, which is dermis that's been injured. Um, these are painful. But if it's only partial thickness, if some dermis still survives, then they usually will heal by three weeks. And depending on their depth, they may um, cause a lot of scarring, which interferes with function. That's especially important if they're over joints or over um, you know, cosmetically important areas, particularly the face or the hands, that um, can really interfere with function and cause long-term problems. And this is the uh, really the deep, uh, even deeper burn we call a full thickness burn. And this burn involves all the layers of the epidermis and dermis. And uh, they're all dead. You'll, this is typically uh, like this with a, what we call a dry eschar. You'll notice that this part of the burn is, has, you can see light reflected. Um, that the, the edges here are probably deep partial thickness burns, but they're not full thickness burns. But this center part is very dull colored, and if you took um, uh, a cotton applicator and you touched either the cotton tip or the wooden end of it, the patient wouldn't feel pain. And that's one of the hallmarks is that they really have no pain. Sometimes these, instead of being white, they're brown or black, which just means that um, deeper structures are burned. And Dr. Gear brought up the part with uh, dirt bikes. There was a question from the back, what about dirt bikes? And I'll just uh, reminded me that yesterday I took care of a patient I've known now for three weeks. And I know that because he came the first day that we started Epic. But he, um, and I won't forget that day, but he was, uh, it was his 12th or 13th birthday, 12th, 12th, yeah, 12th, 12th birthday. And he had a bunch of buddies over and his parents had two motorbikes. And he would, they were taking turns. He would ride on the motorbike with out one of his friends, go out for 10 or 15 minutes and come back. And one of the times he didn't come back and his dad went looking for him and an hour later found him underneath the bike, which had tipped over on him and he wasn't strong enough to pull it off of himself. And the muffler was sitting on his thigh and he had a burn, what we call a fourth degree burn. So he burned all of his skin and part of the subcutaneous tissues and part of the muscle. So he spent three weeks with a burn like this, getting every couple of days, going back to the operating room, having a little bit more taken off that was dead, until we finally got live tissue, and then had a dermal graft using some artificial um, material to sort of help account for some of the depth that he lost from all that tissue. And then finally yesterday I had a skin graft. And then a week from now we'll come back to my office and hopefully that'll all be healed and that'll be the beginning of his recovery. But it's a long period, it'll be a month to get through that. And, um, you know, certainly something his, his parents understand this. I mean, I think they're intelligent enough to understand this and I think they'll probably get rid of the dirt bikes, or hopefully they will, but you just never know. So, what, how do we manage burns? Well, management of burns is pretty important, but it's only really important for the deeper burns. Um, and those are infrequent, but when they happen, they need to be managed properly because they can be lethal. So burn management is a lot like trauma management. We try to simplify it. We talk about the ABCs, and we start with airway. So the patient I had with the burn on his thigh, you know, we don't worry too much about his airway. But this patient, you might, and he was um, putting, uh, he was burning leaves in his backyard wasn't happy with the amount of flame that was there, so he went into the, the garage out back and got a cup of gasoline and threw it into the fire. And the flames um, you know, uh, jumped back at him. And you can see here, he has some pretty disturbing problems. His, his eyebrows are burned, his hair is burned, you can't see it that well. His, his eyelids, eyelashes are singed and his nasal hair is singed. And his face, you can see, is wet here. So he's got a part.
partial thickness burn to his face, and he's got evidence of possible inhalation uh, of flames, which could injure his airway. So he has an endotracheal tube in place to protect him from that kind of situation. So airway evaluation is very important, but only important in the right situation. And people who manage burns um, in, in the heat of the moment can sometimes um, mistake when, when an airway needs to be controlled or needs to be evaluated. But the bottom line is that it's more important, it's better to manage someone's airway um, with an endotracheal tube who doesn't need it than, don't, than not do it for someone who does need it. So when you start this evaluation, you need to think about uh, the objective things in front of you. Uh, a child like this who has a burn to his face or neck is uh, concerning. You want to try to assess if there's smoke inhalation, if there's swelling of the vocal cords, if the patient's unconscious or has breathing difficulties. If any of those things are there, then it's pretty safe to uh, go ahead and, and uh, proceed with innovation to control the airway. The best way to do that is a controlled environment if it's available. Um, and if a patient, um, if there's difficulties or, or a question of um, the person taking, managing the airway is not confident that they can obtain a, a, uh, an airway like an endotracheal intubation, then it may need to be done in an awake fashion. And rarely a surgical airway is needed uh, in the most severe burns. If there are partial thickness burns to the face or neck, if there's soot in the mouth, singed nasal hair, a history of smoke exposure like the patient in the previous picture, then those patients uh, can be managed. They can have uh, pulmonary toilet, good coughing and suctioning uh, and humidified uh, air in a hospital situation closely monitored for a few days. And many of those patients will improve and won't need any further um, steps. But if they develop respiratory failure or signs of airway obstruction, then they should proceed to intubation. So next we talk about breathing and, and breathing, you know, is a, is a kind of goes along with airway, but there are things to think about in those situations. The patient that uh, we showed a picture of, you know, there's a question, did he inhale that flame? And that flame or the heat from the flame can cause injury to the airway. It may not be immediate, it may not be the injury that you see in front of you that's the problem, but it may be the injury hours later when there's edema and airways, the smaller the child, the smaller the airway, the more difference, a small change in the uh, thickness of the tissue that can occlude that airway and obstruct it. The other uh, concern is smoke inhalation, especially in closed spaces like in a house, in the fire picture I showed you a moment ago. Um, the compounds that are combusted, there are many compounds in uh, fabrics, in carpeting, in um, upholstery that can become toxic and very irritating to the uh, respiratory system and they may cause lung injury, um, which may be delayed several days. Also, carbon monoxide, especially in an enclosed environment with smoke, uh, is important to think about. Carbon dioxide binds, um, our hemoglobin is bound more um, strongly than oxygen, uh, so carbon <coughs> dioxide can end up displacing oxygen and causing uh, problems with oxygenation in patients. And finally, circulation. Circulation, we worry about burn patients because their skin is injured, they have um, an injury to their homeostasis of temperature control. So environment is very important for them. Uh, warm fluids, warm environment are, are important to maintain during evaluation. Even in a hot summer day uh, in Winston-Salem, you would worry about exposure of a patient who is severely burned. Those patients, because of their injury, depending on the amount of, of uh, their body burned, will lose fluids because of the uh, injured barrier that the skin uh, gives up. And depending on their body surface area burn, that can be a lot of fluid. So resuscitation of burn patients is dependent on the amount of body surface area burned. And we only include the partial and full thickness burns, so we don't include superficial burns. Um, 
and also inhalation injury plays plays into that volume that's needed. So we talked about not including first degree burns, and most children are only need to a fluid resuscitation for burns greater than 15 or 20 percent. Um, so again, if people who are doing pre-hospital or emergency department evaluation of patients, it's common to think that patients with a 7% burn or a 4% burn needs extra fluids, and really they don't. There's more and more data coming out that despite our, our history of, of giving people extra fluids and burns, that, that we also can harm them by giving too much fluids, and, and I, I don't think that anyone knows an exact number to use. In children, it becomes more difficult because most of the guidelines and most, of, most people are taught how to manage burns in adults, and they try to adapt that to children, and it doesn't work very well. And particularly for calculating um, body surface area. So in a typical uh, adult patient, the rule of nines, which many people in this room have probably learned, shows um, an easy way to calculate burns. So each upper extremity is 9% of burn. Each lower extremity is 9% for the front, 9% for the back, so 18%. The torso is 36, so it's four nines. And then the head is usually nine or 10 um, in that sort of generalized rule. So that's a, that's a pretty easy way to quickly get a ballpark figure. The problem is, in serious burns, the numbers are really not accurate enough to act to manage a patient for very long that way, because the, the differences can make a, a huge difference. And this is why it's not accurate in children. Here's the adult rule of nines we just saw, but in kids, as your age changes, you can see in this adult, 10% for the head, but in a one-year-old, the head is relatively bigger. It has a much bo bigger body surface area, almost twice as big as an adult. And you know the rest of the body sort of changes proportionally, but, but not, in the, not in a normal proportion. So if you didn't know these numbers and you use adult numbers, you'd be way off in, in calculating the burns for a child. So for that reason, we, most burn centers use this uh, chart called the Lund and Browder chart, which is based on data um, taken from children, and you can see here it's different ages. So, so many of the uh, areas are the same in children and adults, but areas here in letters, A, B, C, are different in different ages, and, and below here are the, the uh, values for ages 0, 1, 5, 10, 15, and adult. So those can be calculated and give a much more accurate assessment. We use these in the burn unit at the hospital for patients who come in who have, uh, who have large burns. And um, it's, it's a very accurate way to assess the burns and then to treat them. So how do we treat them? The burn resuscitation, there are many formulas used. Um, this is just one formula that we use, the modified Parkland formula. And it, it um, takes body surface area into account in the first 24 hours using extra fluid lactated bringers, four ml per kilogram per percent total body surface area burn. That is in addition to maintenance fluids that a child uh, of that size or age would need. For the extra fluid, you would give 50% over the first eight hours, then 50% over the next 16 hours, and then um, reassess. The adequacy of your um, Fluid resuscitation is really measured by physiologic factors, normal pulse blood pressure and a urine output of between one half and one cc per kilogram per hour. After the first 24 hours, we would shift to a more maintenance kind of fluids um, and, and maybe use albumin in some patients to uh, keep their choloid osmotic pressure more normal. So, Every burn talk has an example of how you calculate this, so I thought that I would add that. And this is a, an example of a five-year-old who sustained a flame burn to the uh, back um, and lower extremities. So here in this example, the back would be 13% for a five-year-old, same as it would be in an adult. The uh, buttocks would be 2.5% each, so 5%. The lower extremities would be uh, 4% uh, each 
um, for a total of 26% body surface area. So the only thing that was different in this example were the, were the thighs, which in a five-year-old would be 4% versus in an adult would be four and three-quarter percent. So that's not too much of a difference, but anyways, we get this 26%. So the Parkland maintenance would be 100, I'm sorry, the regular maintenance fluids would be 100 ml per kilogram per day for the first 10 kilograms, which would be 1,000 mLs plus 50 mLs per kilogram per day for the second 10 kilograms, that would be uh, 500 mLs for a 20 kilogram person, divided by 24 hours, 1,500 divided by 24 is 62 and a half mLs per hour. So your maintenance fluids, without being burned, would be D5 half normal saline at 63 mLs per hour. So that would be the place to start. Now your additional fluids, you would use 26% body surface area times 4 ml per kilogram, the Parkland formula, times 20 kilograms of weight, which would be um, 20, 80 mLs per 24 hours, which would equate to 130 mLs per hour for the first eight hours, so a lot of fluid for a five-year-old, and then 65 mLs per hour for the next 16 hours. And during that time, you'd be assessing heart rate, blood pressure, and urine output to see if that was adequate. All right, so management of those patients. Initially, um, management is, is in the hospital for severe burns. Uh, resuscitation, we just talked about, that's an important phase of burn management, but nutrition is, is probably equally important. <coughs> and many studies have shown that uh, burn patients do better the quicker you give them nutrition. Some groups have, have um, really been proponents of early nutrition such that they'd put a feeding tube, uh, you know, a, a nasal tube in a patient in the emergency department and within the first hour after a burn would start nutrition. Nutrition uh, has a lot of benefits, uh, fighting infections and healing uh, burns, it lowers hospital stay, lowers uh, complication rates in the hospital in general. And it's something that we try to do whenever we can. Um, the burn wound then has to be um, evaluated and managed and initially we expect in most burns that the burn will progress because it's not just the heat that causes the injury but it's also the body's response and sometimes we can't really tell and it's hard for for uh, parents to understand you know what are you waiting for why are you why can't you tell me how bad the burn is but often we don't know in children more than adults we are conservative with, with management of burns. So many adult um, programs um, are based on the fact of early burn excision and grafting. So within 24 or 48 hours, they would plan to excise a burn that they didn't think would heal and, and put skin grafts. Whereas in children, most places, unless they're very large burns, would um, err on the fact of, of watching a burn, see what happens, Many burns that initially look bad will do better than you think. Some will heal completely or some will heal partially so that the amount of, of uh, burn that has to be excised and grafted is less. So the initial therapy is, is topical antibiotics and dressing changes to evaluate the possibility of healing. So there are different types of topical agents that we use. The three main types I'll talk about now, mafenide or sulfamylon, is a very old um, medication, very good, broad antimicrobial, and it's the most potent of all the antimicrobials. It has a benefit that it completely um, penetrates eschar, and eschar is just the burned skin, dead skin. It's very hard to penetrate because it, it, uh, it isn't alive, it's kind of like leather. Um, but Mafenide has two bad things. One is it can cause metabolic acidosis, especially if it's in a large surface area, and it's also very painful. So we don't use it very often in children. The most common topical uh, antibiotic we would use would be silvadine or sil silver sulfadiazine, uh, which is, a broad, again, a broad antimicrobial. It has incomplete penetration of the SCAR, though, um, and it has toxicity of leukopenia. 
so as we're doing it, we have to keep, as we're using it, we have to keep in mind uh, patients, especially with a large body surface area, um, is their white count decreasing during therapy and keep an eye on that. And it also needs to be dressed. So you need to put dressings on patients. It needs to be changed twice a day, but it has the benefit that it's not painful. It's very well tolerated and um, patients do well with it. And then the last one we use is bacitracin, which is very good for gram-positive organisms. Again, it doesn't penetrate eschar. It has some renal toxicity, but it's usually not absorbed very well. Um, and it also has the added benefit that dressings aren't needed. So often we put this on superficial burns or burns uh, around the face or head and neck. So we have, I'm going to show you some algorithms of, of way burns can be managed depending on what type of burn and how extensive they are. And uh, flame burns, you know, that are extensive, if they're circumferential and they're on an extremity or the chest wall, then they may require pretty prompt surgical management with what we call an escherotomy. An escherotomy is simply just cutting through the dead skin with a knife. It's either done um, with a regular knife blade or with electric cautery. It's not done under anesthesia because there's no feeling in that, in that skin. Um, uh, sometimes we, you know, will sedate children if they're very aware and awake, but they usually don't feel anything that you're doing. And it's an unusual thing to have to do, but it can be um, life-saving in a patient that has chest wall burns who can't breathe or can't ventilate because of the constriction of the dead skin and the swelling underneath it. And once you make those cuts, which are pretty extensive in a, in a, for a chest down both sides, usually the skin pops open and you get more um, ability for the patient to breathe to you know expand their chest same thing with extremities if they're on arms or legs they can be uh, extremity saving kind of procedures because otherwise the um, vascular um, tone of the extremity uh, goes away there's no blood flow to the distal extremity and it can lead to losing that extremity but those are unusual things to have to do, thank, thank goodness. Um, an obvious third degree burn or one that does not improve in the first five days then for, from a flame burn usually undergoes excision and skin grafting. Now extensive burns that are, um, an eschar is white or brown like the picture I showed with the third degree of burn, then that can be placed in either sulfur, sulfadiazine or mafinide um, and dressing changes, it can, be, it can be looked at. And if in five days that doesn't improve, uh, and it is, seems to be an obvious third degree burn, then that may need uh, excision and skin grafting. But um, it also, and, and, and in large burns where there's not enough donor sites available because you've done grafting or you're waiting for skin to heal, you may put on biologic dressings like cadaver skin um, that can be used temporarily to cover that area until uh, the patient's own skin is available. Burns that improve with dressing changes, um, you may see resolution of the eschar, thinning of the eschar in the first week, and those burns then may be able to transition over to bacitracin with an inclusive dressing that um, will eventually hopefully heal. So limited burns, small burns, um, they may have an eschar that is white or brown, and they're treated uh, in a similar fashion as extensive burns. Smaller burns may go, uh, be able to go right to uh, bacitracin with an occlusive dressing if they show that they have um, a red base that, is, that blanches so that it has blood flow in it. Now, scald burns are treated somewhat uh, similarly, but they <coughs> have different patterns of injury, those burns are usually evaluated at, at, in a day, at 24 hours or so, to see what um, injury is eventually going to uh, surface. So if that's going to be a full thickness or a partial thickness injury. If the eschar is white, we use silvadine and may consider collagenase, which would help get rid of the eschar, which dissolves it. It's an enzyme that will only dissolve dead skin and not dissolve live skin. Um, after five days, if the wound is still thick and white, 
may be an indication that it's full thickness and it may need a skin graft. If the, if the eschar thins at five days, then we continue with uh, cleaning it, sometimes using a whirlpool um, and the antimicrobial cream of choice. Um, and if that doesn't uh, completely resolve in two weeks, then usually we would go ahead and excise that burn and skin graft it. Um, and if you, you would switch to bacitracin as the wound bed clears, as in a flame burn. Um, if the wound appears red with a clean base initially, then you may be able to use bacitracin and an occlusive dressing. Okay. So there are different schemes, but those are general schemes of managing burns um, that we would use on, on our patients that we would see in the hospital. So I'd like to show you some data from some research that we've done that uh, Doug Swartz, who's a fourth year medical student interested in, in surgery and is applying right now for surgery residencies, um, helped get together. And, and we asked ourselves, you know, what is the difference in total body surface area of a burn when it's estimated at the referring institution uh, compared to what it is when we see the patient in the, burn, in the burn unit or in the burn center? And how does that impact the amount of fluid that a patient might get? So we took data from uh, retrospectively um, from seven and a quarter years, from January uh, 2005 to March uh, 2012, and looked at that data, trying to look at um, data from the outside hospital and from our institution. We found 423 patients that we saw in that time, age zero to 16 years. 298 were init initially came from a referring institution. That, that was the majority, 70%. We excluded 31 because we had incomplete records. And 125 came directly to the Children's Hospital, 30% of them. And this table shows you that 61% um, of the burns were skull burns. So that's the most common burn, followed by flame burns, 23%, and then a smattering of other type of burns. The most uh, common were patients with less than 10% burns. 70% of them were less than 10%. And you can see that the percentages decrease pretty quickly as you go up higher and higher. So we only had one patient that was greater than 50% burns. Um, if we look at the um, overestimation of burns by uh, referring institution, it was fairly considerable. Patients with between zero and 10% burns, their mean that the average amount that the burn was overestimated was five and a half percent. So a burn that was really 10% was called 15%. But the standard deviation is very large and, and there was a huge range. The bottom line is that most burns are, are, are overestimated by the referring institution. And if you look here, the burns that were the least overestimated were the 20 to 30 percent burns, but bigger burns were even higher, and the, the largest burns, the 50 to 60 percent, was uh, overestimated by a considerable amount. And that causes problems uh, with management, because many times these patients come from far distances. We don't see them for many hours after their injury, and we have to base our recommendations on treatment based on wrong information. So it gets hard. Um, to do that, and, and by the time they come to see us, it's hard to change and take away all the fluid that we gave them that they might not have needed. So here, um, it's overestimated. Um, it, patients were, patients who had their body surface area overestimated received on average 40% excess fluids. So that's a lot of fluids. Um, but even patients that were not overestimated, because of the way the burn resuscitation was calculated at the referring institution, um, still received 28% excess fluids. So there's a lot of uh, work to be done. Um, we have um, worked in trying to send uh, posters and cards with London Browder chart to, to all the local, or I think, is it all the whole state? Where's Ginger? The region, okay, and all the regions. So these are available in your hospitals. If you don't have them, you can contact Ginger. 
and she will be glad to get them to you so you can hang them up in the emergency department or anywhere else where you wish in your institution so they'll be available. These are not things that we invented. They're things that are common. They're in lots of books and things, but they're often hard to find. And they're much more handy if they're hanging on the wall when the patient comes in with a burn. I think that looking over this data and, and seeing quite an, an excess of, of estimation of burns, that the problem is that when I showed you the London Browder chart, and I showed you that the body surface area of the back is 13%, many people, if there's a small splotch in the back, they wrongly calculate the whole back as being burned. So they don't take a proportion of that area that they, and you know, so there is some guesstimation in all of this, but you know, you should be within 5% total body surface area really at the most, um, especially on smaller burns, it's easy, easier to calculate. So the other question uh, that I wanted to sort of show some data from is what's the, what's the survival rate of burns, especially patients who are badly burned? And I found this study, this came out this year in the Lancet from uh, the Shriners Hospital for Ch Children. So a very high level uh, specialty burn center for ch specifically for children at uh, UT Galveston. has been known for years to be really one of the pioneers of burn care in children. So this is, the this is the best that it gets. So they reported their data, single center prospective observational cohort patients through a database that they maintain. And these are big burns. They're all greater than 30% total body surface area. So big burns, they require a lot of care, ICU care, uh, a lot of surgery, a lot of rehabilitation. They looked their, at their registry for 11 years and reported the data. And, and again, this chart is not made to have you look at every data, but I highlighted a couple of things. So the operations needed, you'll notice on the top here, this is you know, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, all the way up to 100% burns. And not surprisingly, the more you're burned, the more surface area, the more operations you're gonna need to take care of this. And, and patients with 100% burns needed on average eight, eight operations. But the interesting thing is survival. The mortality rate is really quite low if you if you're involved in taking care of patients with burns. You can see a 30% burn has a 3% mortality rate. That's a big burn. I would expect that to be much higher. And even the highest, the worst burns, 100% burn, only had a 55% mortality rate. So those are very good figures. And the the, the probably the take-home message from this slide is that if you have a child. Uh, that you're taking care of, or your own child that's severely burned, they, do, they deserve to be in a real specialty burn center. Wherever that be, they should go there. They looked at uh, things that impacted mortality, and they found that the biggest uh, impact of mortality was burn area greater than 60% total body surface area. Inhalation injury um, made the uh, mortality three times those of patients who did not have an inhalation injury. And interestingly enough, female sex also was a predictor for uh, mortality. It had twice the mortality of boys. The age and the time between uh, burn to admission to their hospital did not impact survival. All right, so I've given you a lot of data and a lot of uh, information, and, and the next thing is, is what we're the worst at in medicine, I, I think, is prevention. And, and an article I found in the Journal of Craniofacial Surgery had some suggestions. Most of them are common sense suggestions, but they're worth talking about. So how can we prevent skull burns, or how might we prevent skull burns? Cooking foods on the back burner. Right? Pretty common sense kind of thing. And if you have small children and you know that they start reaching for things on the counter as soon as they start walking and they get a little taller and they can reach more and their brain hasn't changed too much so they don't know what they're reaching for and they can't see it either, but they're just reaching. So that's probably good advice. Turning handles to the back or the center of the stove, again, to prevent children from reaching them is probably makes a lot of sense. Neither of these things cost any money. They're pretty easy to do, and it's like putting on your seatbelt, but the things that you have to think about doing to do. Never holding a child while you're working around hot substances. You know, we have lots of uh, parents that, that are, are doing their best, you know, and they have a hot cup of coffee and their child comes up from behind them and, and spills it, or they're taking a hot um, pot off of the stove and, and 
dumping it into the, into the uh, bathtub or dumping it into the sink or something like that, and they get knocked by their child and spill it on them and they burn. Um, and being aware where children are when you're transferring those hot foods from one location to another. So those are all very common sense, simple things to do. Setting the thermostat of your hot water heater to less than 120 degrees. How many people know what the temperature of the hot water heater is right now in their house? Anyone here know it? Not many people. Okay, you might want to check that if you have young children or also elderly adults because the water coming out of your, your faucet can burn pretty quickly, you know, if you're not conscious of that, if it's set too high. You should always test the water before placing your child into a bathtub. How many people have a thermometer in their bathtub? Anyone here? Wow, good. Julie, you're doing all right. Good. So maybe the rest of you, you put your elbow in or something and can feel how hot it is. But, but you really should at least, the lesson there is to be testing the water. You know, we see a, a significant number of kids whose parents, uh, for some reason, didn't think the water was that hot. They run the tub. They take their child, stick them in the tub. They start crying. They take them out. And, you know, they're burned because they didn't feel the water. And last, never leave a child unattended in the bathtub because we know bad things can happen. Contact burns, obviously monitoring a child closely when hot objects are nearby is very important. To prevent electrical burns, keeping cords out of the reach of children, unplugging cords whenever possible, and having you know, safety outlets, and monitoring children when they're near electrical cords is important. Finally, I'd just like to share um, some suggestions about transfer to burn centers. And there are criteria that are published that make sense, um, and we'll go over them now. So burns greater than 10% total body surface area in a child are probably a reason to transfer to a center that takes care of burns specifically. Burns that are greater than 5% full thickness component. Burns with complicated injury or trauma, so burns with you know, fractures or um, abdominal injuries or chest injuries combined with burns should be seen in a, in a trauma center, a pediatrics trauma center, preferably. Electrical burns, including lightning injury, uh, inhalation injury, any inhalation injury, those patients are likely going to need ICU care. And if they're children, they should be in a pediatric intensive care unit. Um, burns in young children are very important. They're harder to manage. They need more dedicated uh, people who are used to take care of those patients. It's, it's very, there, there are issues that people who don't take care of children wouldn't even think of, like how do you keep an IV in a six-month-old with burns in 30% of his body? How do you, how do you uh, fasten the endotracheal tube to someone who has burned skin all around their face and their neck? So those are things that become really challenging, in, particularly in children and in young children. Um, and burns involving the face, hands, feet, perineum, or major joints, which are going to need um, thoughtful uh, care and uh, long-term you know, reconstruction and rehabilitation or better managed in the burn center. All right. Questions? Even silly ones. Yes. In our area. Silvadine? No, no. One, oh, one percent. Yes, 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 yes. I'm sorry for surface area. Yes. So the question was, you know, is a general guideline that the palm, the surface area of the hand is one percent burn, and that is a good guideline. But you, the, the other thing is that sometimes people in the in the thrill of victory, thinking that they're doing it right, are using their hand in a two-year-old. So you've got to use the child's hand what we should say, so be specific. But yes, I mean, that's a good, especially for small burns, because, you know, there's a difference between a 2% burn and a 10% burn, but you'd be surprised how many kids that we see who have a 1.5% to 2% burn that get billed as a 10 to 15% burn. So then you're concerned on the phone, well, should we start a fluid resuscitation or not? I mean, a burn like that could probably be discharged from an emergency department and follow up with someone several days later. So it, it does make a difference in a, in a lot of ways. Yes? Um, what's your recommendation of treating a uh, burn, for example, in a toddler, a salty burn, a hot coffee? Right. Um, that's waiting for transfer to another facility. Because we've been treating right. some thinking away from grabbing and bobs and saline or just running up like a cover with a sheet. 
Right. I think that I think that most of the time it's best because again we don't know how long those things are going to be. The the best thing would probably be to put something like silvadine on it, and it would keep it moist. Covering it is important. It also is more comfortable because burns that are partial thickness that have exposed nerves that are inflamed are very painful. So just air going across them is very painful, and if they have dressings only on them, that could be painful. But putting something like cream, which is a barrier, and it's, it's antibiotic, and then wrapping it up is fine. It's easy to take that stuff off. You know, it's not a big deal to do it, especially in an acute setting. Most children like that, we give, you know, lots of pain medicine to, or a lot of times we, we call up our anesthesia colleagues and uh, have them put them to sleep in the operating room and take all the dead skin off, take our, our um, opportunity to really clean the burn really well initially so that the rest of that doesn't have to be done in little pieces along the way. So yeah, I would just put on you know, some silvadine, something like that, and wrap a burn up in that kind of situation. Other questions? Yes. What do you mean by water? Yeah, well, they used to, I used to be a paramedic, but they said if the burn was greater than 10%, that we should not use water as a means of treating the symptoms. Right. Because the symptoms are Yeah, that's a good question. So cool, cooling would never, ever be indicated for a burn. Um, water could be indicated for a chemical burn to dilute it, but for a thermal burn, cooling would never be you know, the right thing to do. It would always be to use you know, a covering that's clean, uh, at least in a pre-hospital kind of setting, because the, the injury is already done by the time you see the patient. The, the, it, the skin cools very rapidly. It's not the heat at that point that's causing the injury. It's the body's, it's the injury that's been done and the body's response to it. Any other questions? All right, thank you.